what time it is. Uh, welcome to the Family Church. My name is Pastor David Mendoza. Absolute pleasure to be with you guys one more time on this beautiful Sunday. How many of you guys are ready to receive the Word and spend some time in the Word? Amen. God is good. Excited to be with you guys here. Before I enter too much into that, let's give a warm welcome to those who are joining us via our Facebook live stream as well. Can we give it up for the family who's streaming this at home? God bless you guys. And uh, I had a few weeks off, so I had the chance to rest and recover, and we were blessed to receive, if you guys were here, from Pastor Carl these last few weeks. How many of you guys were blessed by the life and ministry of Pastor Carl? Amen. Uh, same thing in our Spanish services. We had Mario covering those services, and it's an amazing and a blessing for me to be able to not only participate in the church, but I get to also see and receive from the many ministers that the Lord has provided this house. Amen. Uh, so I'm going to start a new series today. It's a, I'm kind of... Being led in this particular series might be a few weeks long. I don't know exactly how long it'll be, but this series that I'm going to spend some time on, I've titled the word on the screen. Some of you guys are looking at it kind of strange. (laughs) You're like, what does that say? Here's what that word says. The word is magnanimous. How many of you guys like, say it with me nice and loud. Magnanimous. I like that word. Uh, It's it's a word that I think we'll remember. (laughs) That's the reason why I I selected it, because I like the word. I think it's something we're not going to forget. It's going to stick in our head. And it's something that I want to kind of talk about over these next few weeks. I was trying to find a way to capture what I feel the Holy Spirit is leading us into as a church. I believe He's being very practical with us. He's leading our marriages. He's leading us as individuals. He's walking us through healing. He's being very intentional and loving to his congregation. And as a result, I was kind of thinking that to receive these kind of gifts, to be able to walk hand in hand with God, we have to have a certain spirit to be able to walk with him in it and be obedient to everything he's asking us to be. The word that originally came to my mind was sacrifice. We need to be able to sacrifice and be able to listen to the word of God. I have words like obedience. I have words like we have to be noble and and, and be able to receive everything God has for us, open to receive what he has. And then I looked up this word and I I just thought it was an amazing word. It's magnanimous and it captures the essence of what I'm going to communicate this next few weeks. And I have a definition for you so you will never forget it. Uh, Here's the definition that will give you an idea of why I chose it. A magnanimous person is someone who possesses a generous and noble spirit, characterized by a willingness to forgive or overlook faults, show kindness and compassion, even in challenging or difficult circumstances. Uh, How many of you guys are drawn to people with these kind of characteristics? I'm a big movie guy. I love watching movies, and I'm moved by the stories of, in the news and movies about individuals who have a very big, magnanimous spirit. The other day, I saw this movie called uh, Hacksaw Ridge. Anybody ever seen this movie before? Hacksaw Ridge? Show, show of hands real quick. Some of you guys have seen it. It's about this guy named Desmond who was a medic and who dragged about 75 gentlemen off the, the, a battlefield when he, re- he really didn't have to. Everybody else had abandoned the battlefield. It was overrun by the enemy. He decided to stay behind and start one at a timing them off of the field and leading them to the camp so that they can go home. All the time praying, Lord, help me find one more. Lord, help me find one more. It's an amazing, amazing story. And I'm inspired by stories like that. I'm inspired by people who are big spirited who are willing to go that extra mile, who are willing to forgive, who are willing to love, even if it costs them something. Uh, How many of you guys know people like this? I'm encouraged by people like this. Uh, It's something that's beautiful. And actually, I believe that Christ himself has and captures the essence of this big spirit, a magnanimous spirit. Christ himself has given us sacrifice, has given us at a great cost. Even if it costs him, he was loving and encouraging to us. A lot of us think, when I say that, we think about the cross But to tell you the truth, Christ lived his entire life this way, in a very magnanimous way. He was constantly serving, constantly loving, constantly forgiving, no matter what it cost him. I'm reminded of a scripture in Mark 6. It's not on the screen, but it's a story that I thought was amusing and interesting that Jesus was ministering with his disciples. And at the end of the day, the disciples tell him, Jesus, let's get moving. Let's find, let's find some solitude. We've done enough ministry for the day almost, right? So they get on a boat. They move away from the crowd. They go to the other side. But the crowd was in such desperate need of Jesus that they followed him. <laughs> He, he got away from them with his disciples, not necessarily to like get away, but he, I'm sure he was tired. I'm sure it was the end of the day, you know, and he needed time. So he got away, he lands on the other side of the shore, and everybody's there again. <laughs> they tracked him, they ran after him, and they were waiting for him. The Bible says that when he got off the boat, he saw them as sheep without shepherds. And he started ministering to them again. You imagine that? Like he, he, maybe he needed a break. He was also flesh and bone. He started to minister to them again. They started teaching all day long. The afternoon came around again. And the disciples tell him, Jesus, 
shoo shoo, send them home. <laughs> you know, like, go ahead and send them to their house so they can get a meal. It's been a long day. And Jesus says, you feed them. And actually, that, that, in that particular scripture, that's actually the feeding of the 5,000. Yeah, so let's get away from them. They won't leave them alone. He doesn't care. He's going to minister. He's going to feed. He's going to teach, no matter what the personal cost might be. This is Jesus. Amen? Uh, there's a sinner that nobody wants to hang out with, that everybody judges. He goes and has a meal with them. Come on, let's sit down for some tacos. Uh, <laughs> he, there's a leper who everybody has kicked out of their town because of, of the, 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 the idea of what leprosy meant. He can't be touched. He can't be close to the town. He or she had to be distant. They had to be isolated. They had to be separated. Jesus finds them, prays for them, lays hands on them. This is Jesus. Like Jesus is a magnanimous Big spirited guy. He's on the cross. Listen to this. He's on the cross being murdered unjustly, basically, and he starts ministering and praying for the people murdering him. Whoa. Uh, I, I can't even pray for the people at HEB sometimes <laughs> on the expressway. Come on, like, come on, right? Jesus is such a magnanimous, big spirited, beautiful illustration to say, no matter what it costs me, I have a noble and loving and giving spirit. Even in the, the, the circumstances and the trials, I will give, I will forgive, and I will sacrifice myself for those around me. It's an amazing, amazing thing. I'm inspired by it. I believe God is, is showing it to us in Jesus Christ. But this is where I want to kick off the lesson. I want you to go to Ephesians 5 with me. Ephesians 5, verse 1 and 2, and this is the heartbeat of the next few weeks together. If he is big-spirited, if he is magnanimous, if he is such a wonderful and beautiful God to us, what must we be? Ephesians 5 tells us. Ephesians 5, verse 1, pay attention to what it says there. Therefore, TFC Westlicko, be imitators of God. As beloved children, walk in love as Christ loved us. And there it is. And he gave himself up. For us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. If Jesus is magnanimous, church, I'm here to tell you over these next few weeks, we've been called to encapsulate, to imitate, to reflect this magnanimous spirit to the world. This sacrifice, this love. Go with me to Ephesians 5.15. Same, same, same scripture, same uh, chapter. Look what it says there. It says, look carefully then, TFC Westlake, how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best use of the time. You're not allowed to live like in the valley in the land of manana. <laughs> we'll do everything manana tomorrow. No, no. Make best use of the time. Because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, TFC Westlaco, for that is debauchery. But be filled instead with the Holy Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, with a gratefulness, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Uh, Paul in Ephesians 5 is laying out a beautiful illustration of what we're called to be. Actually, as a matter of fact, Ephesians 1 through about Ephesians 4, he's very practical and he's very, like he teaches us the beauty of what God has done because he died for us, because he's reflected this magnanimous spirit to us. He's done all these wonderful things. He's made us a new body of believers. He's done these amazing things for us. And then in chapter 5, he says, therefore, because he's done all this, we should live this way. Because we understand who he is, because we're aware of how he works, because we're aware of who we serve Therefore, we're called. And did you notice that in Ephesians 5.20, it said, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Does that ring a bell for anybody? The reason why that might ring a bell is because right after that, in Ephesians 5.22, we get into the wonderful teaching on marriage. Anybody remember these teachings in Ephesians 5? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. That's where that is. It's right after this section. And the heart of what I'm trying to communicate is that if we understand that we're called to have a magnanimous spirit, we're called to be a giving people, how many of you guys know that really changes the world? When somebody does things like that, like 
Desmond Doss carting soldiers out for no reason other than the fact that he wants to be used by the hand of God. When somebody does what Jesus does while he's being persecuted, he prays for his persecutors. When somebody, no matter how tired they might be, no matter how long their day has been, they will set aside their own personal feelings to minister to somebody else. When we do these kind of things, church, listen to me, it sets a wonderful example for the world of the God that we love and the God that we serve. It's part of our DNA. It's part of what Christ wants us to be, and he's called us to be. But the reason why I wanted to talk about this today is because I realize that if we live this way, we'll be an example. We'll show the world. God can do amazing things not only in our lives, but in the lives of those around us if we embrace this attitude of being transformed by God and reflecting his spirit to the world. I believe that, and I 100% am about it. As a matter of fact, most of the time that I'm up here, I like to be very practical in the way I teach. I want to give you two or three things to walk away with, to remember on the way home and say, David said this, David said this. I want you to have handles on how to live this out. But Paul does something here in Ephesians 5, and actually in Ephesians 4, that I want to spend some time on because I think it's important. Paul, in Ephesians 5 and Ephesians 6 and Galatians and all over Scripture, he wants to teach us how to live this way. He wants to show us practically what that means. Stop doing this, start doing this. But a lot of times, I want to do the same thing. And what I realized was that sometimes I'm actually not giving you the full picture of what's happening. Paul, in Ephesians 4, before he talks about submitting, before he teaches on marriage, he says something that kind of caught my attention. In Ephesians 4, he's talking about the world. So he's saying, you guys should be like this, right? But then he says, but the world, by the way, I'm sure you already figured this out. The people who don't follow God, the people who aren't aware of God, and this isn't a judgment. This isn't me being hateful. This is just what scripture teaches. If they've given themselves over to sin, if they've given themselves over to everything but God, then they're going to live a very unique way. Their their understanding is going to be a little bit darkened. When, when, when the, the word of God comes in, they're not going to really listen. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Their heart is hard. Like the, the, the Bible actually says that. They're, they're hard-hearted where they're, they have a certain way of living. And then the, the word of God will come in. You should do it this way. And it just kind of bounces. They don't feel the need to. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody know anybody like this? Anybody is somebody like this? <laughs> where, where when the word of God comes in, you're like, yeah, I hear you, but that doesn't apply to me. It just kind of like, it bounces. It's hard-hearted. Paul says the world, when they're outside of Christ, are darkened in their understanding. They don't really grasp. It doesn't make any sense why Jesus would do what he did. It doesn't make any sense why that Desmond gentleman did what he did. It doesn't make any sense to the world why we do marriage the way we do marriage. There's a darkening, right? So he says, yeah, in the world you can expect that. But look what he says in Ephesians 4. And this is where I want to kind of plant my flag for a little while here. Ephesians 4.20 says this. After he talks about the world, he says this to the church. But that is not the way you learned Christ. This is important. Look what he says. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. This is so interesting to me. Paul assumes that the people he's talking to have a foundation in Christ. This is important. Listen to me, and follow me a little bit here, and you'll see where I'm going with it in a minute. Paul assumes, he's like, before he gets to Ephesians 5, he says, you know, husbands love your wives as Christ of the church. Uh, Wives submit to your husbands, respect them, honor them. All that stuff is in Ephesians 5. Before he even gets to that, he says, listen, the world is a certain way, and you're supposed to be different, assuming that you actually learned how to be different. <laughs> That's interesting to me. I like that. Because I, as a pastor, sometimes make that mistake. I come up here and I start teaching something about how God wants you to live, how God wants you to transform your marriage, how God wants you to do finances, how God wants you to raise your kids. And what I assume is that you know how God is working with you. But I could be wrong. Maybe you don't know how God works in your life. Maybe you don't have a foundation to know how to take off the old self and put on the new self. Paul says, I'll give you lots of practical things, but I'm going to assume you know how to remove the junk and put on the new. That's big, right? Because a lot of us, we want to hear practical things. David, teach me how to do marriage. Teach me how to do this. But the truth is, maybe you haven't learned the foundational ability to stop doing bad things and start listening to God. 
Does that make sense? Uh, it's almost like lying on your resume. Anybody ever done that before? <laughs> Nobody in, the, in this service either. Wow, that's awesome. We're, we're, we're batting a thousand. <laughs> no, we don't do that. Anybody ever lie on the resume before? Like when you are, maybe you have, maybe you haven't. I've seen it in, you know, films and stuff like that where they lie on their, on their resume and they say, yeah, like I, I know how to, you know, raise horses and I know how to like, you know, uh, do horticulture and I can plant all, and, and they, they exaggerate on their, on their job employment form so they can get hired. And then when they get hired, they give them a task because they said they knew how to do it. You know what I'm talking about? And then what happens? They're like, okay, ride the horse. Show me, it says here that you have 20 years of horsemanship. Like, you know, change his shoes. <laughs> and they're like, ah, you do it first. I want to see how you do it. No, 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 you can't get away with it because you lied on your resume. So you can't do the job later because you weren't really foundation. You didn't have the foundation to do what you said you were going to do. It's similar. I want to teach you practical things on how to be magnanimous, how to be big spirited. Not that I have it all figured out, but you know, the Lord is walking us together. I want to talk about practical ways to improve our life. But what I really want to understand is that before I get to the practical, I want to see what's on your resume. Do you know how to take off the old stuff? That's a good question. Do you know how to take off the stuff and put on the new? The reason why I want to talk about it, honestly, guys, because it really doesn't do me any good. And this is, this is where I'm going to be a bit direct. It really doesn't do me any good or you any good to teach you something you can't practice because you don't have the foundation for it. That sounds harsh, but I want you to follow me. Everything that Paul prescribes in marriage and, 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 and relationship and all these practical things are, are built on an assumption that you're following God, <laughs> that the Holy Spirit is creating within you a sacrificial spirit, that the Holy Spirit is, t- is changing you but there's people in this room, and this is why I wanted to talk about it. There's people in this room today. There was people in this room last week who want to know how to live their life God's way, but aren't listening to the Holy Spirit. Or even worse, don't even have the Holy Spirit in their life. The power source. The one who guides us all. So then I can tell you, do this, do this, do this. And you'll be like, amen, amen. And then you'll try to do it, and what will happen? Anybody ever try to implement change in their life without the power of the Holy Spirit to help them? Believers in the house, anybody help me out with this one? What happens? What happens? You try to like white knuckle it, right? You're like, I got this. I'm a Mendoza watch. And then like, nope. (laughs) Nope. Because the power source wasn't there. Paul says, the world is a certain way, guys. But I assume you guys know how to take off the old and put on the new. And my question is, to start... I don't want to make that assumption this morning or this afternoon. I'd rather talk about it in the open. And rhetorical question, rhetorical question. Do you know how to do that? Do you know how to take off the old habits and put on the new ones? Well, it's, might as well talk about it then, right? Uh, let's, let's, it's might as well. <laughs> You're like, hey, David, and okay, well, let's talk about it. I remember when, uh, I'll give you a scripture and that will help us. So Paul assumes the foundation. Let's talk about the foundation. I remember a few years ago, before, I don't like, I haven't really shared a lot of my testimony recently, uh, just, you know, my life, because I don't like to talk about myself sometimes. You're probably laughing at that. Uh, <laughs> I don't like to talk about my personal story because I want God to work in you. But I'll share a little bit of my experience so you can maybe get some texture of what I'm saying. A few years ago, when I first came to faith, I grew up in a very Pentecostal church. I grew up in a very rigid uh, Bible belt, you know, like follow the rules church. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. As a matter of fact, I knew more about what we're not supposed to do than what we're supposed to. Like I I knew all the don'ts. I didn't know any of the do's. (laughs) So don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. And then, you know, it was just the church I grew up in. I'm not bashing it. It was just what we we had at the time. So as I grew up and as a young man, I started realizing that I was very works-based. I really wanted to do the right thing all the time. And when I couldn't do the right thing all the time, I felt real convicted. I felt fearful. I remember I would break a rule and I would immediately start praying, Lord, please forgive me. Lord, please forgive me. Lord, please forgive me. Because I was afraid Jesus was going to return and leave me. <laughs> I'm not making that up. Like Jesus was going to come back for his glorious body and he was going to leave David because I was playing pool at the bowling alley. <laughs> like I was generally afraid of this. So I would, I would, I would Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. And, and I lived in a fear and I lived like I got to behave. I got to do everything right because I, 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 I just, I have to. That's what we do, right? You have to follow the rules or else you're not, you're a hypocrite. That's what I always believed. 
Then as I got older, uh, I realized that the Lord was calling me back onto himself. He called me not to ministry necessarily, but more just to like, you know, being serious in my faith. He said, you know, it's time for you to get serious in my faith. I felt like he was leading me. So I went out and got this Bible. I forgot the Bible today. I was going to bring it, but I forgot. I got this Bible. It was a massive Bible. I mean, you could beat somebody to death with it. It was a giant orange and black ESV study Bible. It was huge. It was a hardcover. This is the first big Bible I've ever bought. So when I got it, I was like, okay, I'm going to take my, my, my faith seriously. I, had, I wasn't into ministry. I wasn't into anything. This was just David trying to figure out what he knows, right? So I got this giant Bible, and I opened it up. And the Bible, at the very front of the Bible, it had this article, pretty long article, called The, the Plan of Salvation. What it did there is that it almost summarized the Bible, if you can imagine that. I was like, well, I like summaries, right? I like to, to do things faster, so let me read the summary <laughs> instead of reading this whole thing, right? So I started reading the summary. What is the plan of salvation? It was like a summary page. What it actually told me in that plan of salvation, and this was news to 20-something-year-old David, just like it might be news to you. I realized in that plan of salvation that there was a pattern across Scripture that repeated itself over and over and over. And here's the pattern. People don't do good in just simply following rules. Commandments, to just do the commandments and behave and just be, and do the right thing, people fail miserably at that. Let me show you. Uh, Adam and Eve had how many commandments? One. One. Don't eat that. <laughs> that was it. You know, hey, you can do all this. Just don't eat this one. Which commandment? Did, what, did they do it? What did they do? They broke the one that they got. Then he gave them 10 through Moses. Anybody remember the Ten Commandments? Uh, the Chuck Heston movie, Prince of Egypt. I'm a film guy, so I know Chuck Heston descending from the mountain with the thunderbolts and all these different things. Anybody remember the Ten Commandments? Right? So if they didn't do good with one, don't touch that tree. How'd they do with 10? Right? I mean, it's over and over in Scripture. They didn't do it well. Then the 10 became like 400. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know what the answer is to not being able to follow commandments? More commandments. <laughs> it sounds like I'm joking. I'm not joking. This is scripture. They, they, they got more and more and more, and they couldn't fulfill any of them. And then you start to see the pattern. They get to the promised land. I'm giving you like a little biblical overview. If you have your Bible, you can actually do it with me. You can find these chapters. You get to this book called Judges, where there wasn't a king in Israel, but they started having judges, and the pattern started. The people of God would disobey God. They would do what what they saw right in their own eyes. That's what the Bible says. Just do whatever they wanted to. Worship whatever God they wanted to. Behave sexually however they wanted to. Not listen to him at all. And they would go down. They'd cry out to God. God would send somebody like a judge or a king. David, Solomon, uh, uh, Samson, all these different characters in the Bible. They they would win a battle and the Lord would, would help them back up. And then they'd be like, yeah, we repent of our sin, Lord. And we're going to be faithful from now on. And then what would happen? (laughs) <laughs> over and over in scripture. Yes, Lord, I love you and you're so awesome and you help me out of this bind and I'm going to follow you and I'm going to listen to your commandments. No, I don't need to listen to any of those commandments. I'm going to do my life my way and then I'm going to run into this wall and then, oh Lord, I need you to help me. Oh, you help me. I'm going to listen to your commandments. <laughs> okay, that's in scripture. Has anybody experienced that in their life? Yes. Am, I, am I preaching at anybody right now? See, this was never, ever about simply following rules. That's what I didn't know. And that's what, this is why I love these lessons. That's what I'm realizing a lot of you don't know. You think it's about behavior. You think it's just, if I do these 10 things, the Lord is going to bless me and he'll be happy with me. And then when I don't, he's, he's embarrassed with me, he's ashamed of me, and there's some condemnation on me. But then I'll behave again and it'll be better. And there's a cycle. And it's all over Scripture. And here's what I want to talk about it. It's all over you too. So I read this plan of salvation and I realized that it was all over me. And I was like, this is nonsense. This is crazy. This is literally insanity. <laughs> I keep on doing the same thing. I keep on falling for the same. I keep on making. And then I realized there was a reason why that was there. And the Lord had a plan for that. And there comes Jesus Christ. Now, now I'm not going to move fast. I want you to pay attention to what Jesus Christ does. Let's go to Ezekiel. 36. Is this helping anybody? Awesome. Praise God. Yes. Uh, Ezekiel 36. This is a a prophet 
talking about Jesus in the future. He's not, he, he wasn't even around when Jesus was here, but this is a prophet of God, hearing from the Spirit of God and writing down what Jesus is going to be and what he's going to do. And I want you to pay attention to what he does. Okay, this is, this is where the power source is. Ezekiel 36, 25. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, cleanlessness or whatever. Right, I'm going to mess that up. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. See there? Okay, now here we go. Verse 26. And I will give you a new heart. I'm going to give you just behavior modification. No. He's going to give you a new heart and a new Where? Where? This is important. Within you. And I will remove, ooh, this is good. There's surgery involved. <laughs> Listen to this. And I will remove the heart of stone. The one that doesn't want to listen. The one that has trouble following rules. I will remove that one. And I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put, ah, oh, this is so powerful. And I will put my spirit within you. There it is. Don't, don't miss this part. And cause you to walk in my statutes Amen. and be careful to obey my rules. Where does the power come from? I'll bring it up again, verse 27. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk. Where do you get the ability to walk? There it is. That's what I didn't understand. If you're white knuckling this thing, if you don't want to listen to the Holy Spirit, and you're just saying, I'm going to behave myself, and I'm going to modify myself, and I'm going to do what David tells me. If you're just trying to do it on your own, my friend, I love you. You're wasting your time. You cannot. It's impossible. That, that's why I love what Paul is doing here. Before he starts teaching you about marriage, he's like, do you understand this first principle here? <laughs> you're not going to be able to do anything I teach you about marriage. You're not going to be able to do anything about these other things if you don't have the right power source. If you think, I'll just behave. I'll have two or three days of just white knuckling and I'm going to do my best. No, nah. It's the spirit in you that causes you through an open heart surgery. <laughs> it says, I love this. To be able to obey him. Wow. Okay, let's pick up the story again. So, so Dave, not Pastor Dave at the time, just regular old Dave, uh, is reading the plan of salvation. He's thinking, what? So it's not just behavior. He's like, no, it's not just behavior. It's Allowing my spirit to reside within you, walking with me, and I will transform your heart into the ability to listen and to follow and to live this out and to be magnanimous, to be big-spirited. And I didn't understand that at the time, but I felt, I felt it. I felt the release. I felt the, the freedom. I was like, so I've been being super hard on myself, trying to be perfect. And the Holy Spirit was like, yeah. Instead, walk with me. That was the difference. It wasn't just performance. It was relationship with him. You see, you see where I'm leading you? And then I started walking with him and he started kind of showing me and I started kind of pressing into his spirit. Something interesting happened at the time. I was in my, I don't even know how old I was, in my early 20s maybe. I was a young buck. And uh, I, I, I was listening to, at the time, the, the worship music that was really like pegando was a Hillsong, Hillsong United. Anybody remember this Hillsong United? <laughs> Anybody like Hillsong United? Not regular Hillsong, Hillsong United. <laughs> like back in the day, to Take It All and, you know, Hosanna and all these old songs that were just fantastic. At the time, that's what I was playing and that's what I was, I, had, I was experiencing this kind of worship music for the first time. And I was praying and I was looking, at, looking for God and trying to see, like, what are, you, what are you showing me? And there's this one lyric on that song, Hosanna. Anybody heard Hosanna before from Hillsong? There's this one lyric that I made the mistake. <laughs> I say a mistake, but it was actually the beauty. I made it my lyric. I said th this over and over again. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Anybody remember that lyric? And I said, Lord, I I'm starting to understand what you're saying. You love me. and you're trans Yes, I'm transforming. I'm making your hard heart soft. Wonderful. That's cool. Then break my heart for what breaks yours. I had no idea what I was asking for. <laughs> I had no idea at all. But I just tossed that prayer up. Lord, break my heart, man. I love you. And then he started doing it. Not just obedience through rules. He started showing me and breaking my heart, and listen to this, for my spouse. For the way I was treating her. 
Started breaking my heart for my children, the way I was fathering them. Started breaking my heart for my coworkers, the way their understanding was darkened. And they couldn't see. I'll pause for a second here. How many of you guys are frustrated by your coworkers? It's okay. We're in church. I'm, doing, I'm trying to do church with you guys. Raise your hand if it's you. How many of you guys get frustrated by your coworkers? It's okay. Like, I'm not going <laughs> to... Uh, nice and high? Let's, let's own up to this. Let's own up to this. Yes, I love, I, I love the flexibility on a Sunday morning. Okay. You get frustrated by your coworkers? Okay. Go, 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 go. Put your hands down. For a second, consider. They're darkened in their understanding, and you're not. Amen? That's not, that's not a judgment. It's a breaking. A hard heart says, those people, hombre, you know, me traen hasta acá. Like, I can't, I can't put up with them. A hard heart says that. A soft heart that's learning to be broken and softened by the power of the Holy Spirit says, that's the ones that are darkened. They're the ones who've given themselves over to a lot of junk. And it's not a judgment. But could it be that they're in the throes of sin and death and that makes them hard for you to work with? You see how that's different? So he starts to walk me by breaking my heart and showing me these things. Next thing you know, I'm breaking my heart. My, my, my heart breaks for my wife. My heart breaks for my kids. It expands, and all of a sudden, now I have congregations to deal with, and my heart breaks for you all. And this is where the, ser- the sermon circles around to our present. Last week, Pastor Carl, uh, he had an amazing message. If you were here for all our services, Mariel in our Spanish service, or Mariel. Uh, <laughs> I'm in the gringo service. Uh, ma- <laughs> Go on. Uh, Marielle did the same thing there. She did an altar call. Carl did it in, in, in a different way, but he was encouraging people to come up and receive prayer in the first service. He prayed for everybody in the second service. Mario did it in the Spanish service, but for healing. She, was, she felt a strong conviction that there was, there, was, there was disease in the house. So she wanted to, to speak it out. And uh, Carl called people up. She called people up, and the same thing happened across all our services, and it happened in the 10 a.m. service this morning. So I know it happens. Was this. Our heart breaks knowing that the Lord wants to do something in your marriage, wants to do something in your family. In the case of our Spanish service, she was calling out disease, saying there's people who are sick, who need to come up and trust what Scripture says and allow us to lay hands on you and pray for you for healing. And we're throwing out this invitation, and it happened across all our three services, and I'll just call it out to bring it full circle. A lot of people in the congregation said no. Listen to me. Come on up. The Lord is ready to heal. The Lord is ready to break. To, to My friend Carl was brave enough to say, like, some of y'all need to be up here. <laughs> he, didn't quite, he didn't say it quite so eloquently as that. But he did. I remember like first service, he was like, there's some of you, after we was done praying, there's some of you who should have come up. And he's like, but we'll still have a chance to do that. And, and here's my heart behind all this, guys. Listen, some people left carrying that stuff. So listen, what's the point of us telling you how God wants to free you? <laughs> Ouch. If you're going to say no when the door is open. That's the foundation. That's the foundation Paul's talking about. You do know how God's transforming you, right? Do you know? If you don't know, let me tell you. You have to say yes to him. When he speaks through a servant, through his word, through a time at the altar, when he speaks to you, in whatever way that might be, and he directs something in your life, he makes an adjustment. He says, like he did to me, watch out for your wife. You're being completely rude to your wife. He looks to make an adjustment. Then we're like, okay, I, I, I understand that's what he wants from me, but I'm going to say no. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. No, I, I'm going to rationalize my no. You know what? You know, I can't say no. To, I, I'm not going to be able to do that right now because of these five reasons. And the Holy Spirit, and this is my heart, the Holy Spirit, there was healing at this altar. There was freedom at this altar. There was a time to get out of your chair, participate, jump into the pool, and be like, Lord, I trust you with this. I'm going to come up and receive it. And here's the word that the Bible uses for people like that. You ready? Stiff-necked. It means that you know, but your your head is on a certain way, and you're not going to bend. 
So Paul assumes, and this is what I'm doing too, I'm assuming that I'm, I want to teach on, I want to, the reason why I started here is because I would love to teach on marriage. I would love to unpack the realities of Scripture in a bunch of different areas of my life and in yours. I would love that. The reason why I started here is because can I do that if you're going to say no? There's going to be people here that are going to say yes, yeah. But there's also a ton of people mixed in like salt and pepper at the same time <laughs> who are saying no. So where do I start with this? Listen to me. The power source, the ability to take off the old and put on the new is not coming from you. It's not coming from your rationalization. This is how I'm going to do it. Uh huh. David, I would receive that, but you know what? I have my plan. The power source doesn't come from you. And Paul says, you, you do know how God delivers you, right? You were taught, right? <laughs> and if you weren't, you're currently being taught. It does not come from you. It comes from the very power of God inhabiting your being as a gift of the Holy Spirit, as a gift of Jesus Christ, teaching you to obey him. But it requires something very important. A yes. Let me give you a scripture. Galatians 5, 16 through, Galatians 5, 16 through 17. Is this making sense today to everybody? Galatians 5, 16. Listen to this. So I say to TFC Westaco this morning or this afternoon, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. I've moved past that scripture so many times I didn't realize what it just said. Let him. <laughs> Listen to what I just said. Let him do it. Let him guide you. Well, what, what do you mean? If you say no to him, is that letting him? Let him guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. That's where the cycle kicks in. Then you won't be doing that. The sinful nature, by the way, wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you're not free to carry out your good intentions. <laughs> and that's why I wanted to talk about it. I see people here, not only in this auditorium, but in my life and in general, that are not free to carry out their good intentions. They want something from God, but they don't have the freedom to do it. And I think it starts in verse 16. You haven't let him guide you. So how do you do that? Let me finish my story, and, and I'll pray for us. The Lord started teaching me, um, as I kind of drew near to him, break my heart for what breaks yours, Dad. Break my heart for what breaks yours, Dad. Okay, I'll teach you. Good job, son. Now you're listening to me. Okay, I'm going to break your heart for your wife. That's, that, by the way, that's actually where he started, I think. That might have preached to some of y'all. Uh, he started in my relationship with my wife first. Uh, he started breaking my heart for the way I was treating her, the way I was a man, the way I was behaving. He started breaking my heart for that. And he said, okay, now, now I want you to do this. I want you to, and there's a variety of things, you know, use your words, make sure you commit, make sure that you're sold out for this marriage and all these different things. And what did I have to do to, to, to be transformed, to become magnanimous? What did I have to do to be big spirited in my marriage? The first thing I had to do before anything else, what did I have to do? I had to say yes. Yes, Lord. By the way, if you start with yes, it changes the rest of the approach completely. Uh, and when I went to the doctor, I'll, I'll get off of my illustration with my wife for a minute. When I went to the doctor and I found out that I had a bad heart, I found out that I had a bad heart, I couldn't breathe, I, couldn't, I was exercising because I'm all about that exercise life. <laughs> same, same joke always. Uh, and, and I found out something was wrong with my ticker. And he, he's like, well, you know we, don't know, we don't quite know what it is, David, but there's something obviously wrong. We're going to need you to come back on this day, on this day, on this day. We're going to need you to go on this medication and, and do these di different uh, um, tests. Uh, what was I supposed to do? Uh, I don't really feel like doing that. Nah, like, you know what, which one of those are optional? Give me one and three, and I don't want to do four and five. Does that make any sense? Why not? Because the surgeon prescribed a step. This is so powerful. The one who knows is prescribing steps I have to take to live. And I say, I'll do steps three and five. Absolute nonsense, right? Yet, the Holy Spirit says, I know how to live in your marriage. 
Here are five things you got to do. Uh, g- give me one and three. That's, that's the convince me if you can. That's a stiff neck. That's the maybe I'll try it, but maybe if it works enough, that's stubbornness. If you start with a yes, though, yes, Lord, whatever you say. Okay, here's five. Ooh, two, four, and five are hard. <laughs> Listen to what I'm about to say. But I already said yes. <laughs> Jeez, there is such power in that. Listen to what I just said. There's such power in understanding a yes. I already said, okay, four? Four. Yes, I'm going to need you to do that. I'm going to need you to ask for forgiveness from your wife for the junk you've done. Bro. bro. (laughs) As opposed to, okay, let me work my way around this. How am I going to do it? Because I already said yes. You see the difference? It pushes you into obedience as opposed to more stiff-necked. And, and then we're so stuck. Well, no, I'm not going to do two, four, and five steps, and then we'll do one and two. It didn't work. <laughs> the Lord must not be in heaven. He must not be in control. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. You were stubborn. You were stiff-necked. You refused to listen. You didn't give him a yes. You gave him a soft maybe. <laughs> Jeez. So here's where I wanted to start. I would love to talk about marriage. I would love to talk about a bunch of different things in our lives. I would love it. But I stopped all of this to ask you one simple question to start. Are you even saying yes to him? Because if you're not using your marriage as an example, if you're not saying yes to him, here's what it looks like. You'll throw the word divorce so fast. (laughs) I'll divorce you so fast, it'll make your head spin. (laughs) The world that's darkened in their understanding is allowed to behave however they want to behave. Believers are supposed to say yes with their action. So that preaches to somebody in this room. If you're married and you're in the house today, can you use that word as a weapon against your spouse if you're in Christ? It changes everything if you say yes. At that point, there's a listening. There's a willingness. There's almost like you'll figure out the next step. We're promoting LTC right now. We promoted this program for our youth, LTC. If the Lord's called you to that, say yes. Well, it's because there's lots of reasons. No, no, no. Say yes first. (laughs) Then the rest will kind of fall into place. That'll fall into place. Your, your job, your, what all these other, we'll work on that. But the yes to the Holy Spirit is the starting point. Is the Lord working on your marriage? Yes. That's the yes. Does that make sense? I don't want, and I'm going to wrap up in prayer. I don't want the power of God to fall in this place, the power of God to be alive in this congregation, and there be people standing here with a stiff neck, refusing to say yes giving soft maybes, walking away with their sickness when healing was available at the altar. Jeez. Does that make sense? I love you guys. That's why I say it. Do you know how the Lord is transforming you? Do you know how the Lord is transforming you? He's transforming you with all the yeses you're giving him. Stand to your feet with me so I can pray with each and every single one of you. Right where you are, let's spend a few moments in quiet reflection. I won't take long. I know I've gone a little bit longer today, but just I want to reiterate that question and toss it into the room right where you are with heads bowed and eyes closed. Do you know how the Lord is transforming you right now? Yes, he's died for your sin. Yes, he, he has eternity, all these things. But I'm asking specifically, do you know how he's transforming you in September of this year? <laughs> What are the yeses that he's demanding of you right now? What are the yeses that are meant to soften your heart? What area of your life have you kept off limits to the Lord and said no to him on?
there was anointing over the first service, and I'll, I'll apply it here. I might not do the same, but I will apply it here. There was an anointing today, this morning, over the marriages in our, in our church, over families, over marriages. And if that's you right now, right where you are, and you've been experiencing some difficulties in your marriage, and your spouse is with you, for starters, uh, here's what I would encourage. I would encourage to you to set aside the challenges for a minute and just reach out to them and hold their hand for a minute while we pray together. There's an anointing this in this house for the restoration of broken families. It's always been over this house. It's just I don't think we've ever seen God really blow it, blow the doors off of this thing. But it's something that this church does well. We restore broken families. So if that's you right where you are, reach out to your spouse. If they're not here, we stand with you as a church and we pray with you. I didn't say this one in the first service, but I'll say it right now. There's ways in this house that the Lord wants to restore your singleness. There's people who are in this house who have been, who are single parents, or maybe they're not married yet, or maybe they have been and they've, they've experienced a breakup or a separation, and there's a, there's a pain there, there's a heartache there that that we don't always talk about in a, in a church like this, but I want to tell you something right where you are with your head bowed and your eyes closed. I want you to receive this. He, he wants to restore you. He wants to renew you. He wants to bring beauty to these areas. You're not broken by any stretch of the imagination. You've been manhandled. Perhaps you've had some situations in your life. But the Lord is a magnanimous God who finds you in whatever circumstance you're in and redeems you and restores you and makes you something absolutely beautiful that you didn't even know you could become. So Father God, at this moment, Father, we thank you, Father, for your love and your compassion and your magnanimous spirit over this house. Not a single one of us has done anything perhaps to deserve you, Father God, but that doesn't change your grace. That doesn't change your love. And at this moment, Father God, I pray for our marriages in this house. I pray for our families in this house.